Well, good morning. If you haven't seen Soul Surfer, that is a great movie. I can't recommend all the movies I show. Sometimes I actually give disclaimers like, yeah, don't watch that. Uh, but it doesn't mean that there's not a point in the middle of it. I figure if Paul could use a, a false god in order to preach a sermon, then I could probably use a video clip. So uh, that was Bethany Hamilton. If you don't know who she is, you can look her up. She's a Christian surfer. She was attacked by a shark and actually gave up, obviously, was scared of the water. And so that's a scene where she's actually helping somebody else with the hurt that she's been through. And that's, listen, that's the thing that God will do. He will use the very hurts in your life in order for you to bless other people. But he also doesn't give us excuses, which is what I was talking to the kids about today. He had his eyes open during prayer. Isn't it funny how I still remember that? Because my little ADD brain went, what? How could you? Wait a second. And I'm just this little bitty kid, so still remember it. So today we're going to talk about truths about service and stewardship. And we're going to mainly look at Galatians 6. I really like to, if I can, at least use a context passage and bring in some, some uh, supporting text when possible. Uh, I, of course, can't bring them all in. If you have a reference Bible, have fun looking up all the references to another sermon while you're doing it. Um, so I want to show you a picture and tell you a story about a man named Jed. Actually not, but... So... I'm going to start with this sentence. I have finally thrown this trophy away. But let me tell you why. So I was in a pastor's golf tournament, huge golf tournament, and Lifeway paid for hundreds of pastors in Central Florida to play golf. I am a terrible golfer, and the way they would register you is they would say, tell us what your average golf score is, and I did not lie. It was like 112 or something at that time. Right now, I'm probably down to 109. Uh, so it is what it is. So it actually worked for my advantage in this case. So um, what they would do is pair you up, and we played something called Best Buy. How many best ball? How many golfers do we have in here? How many people have ever played golf? Putt putt golf. Okay. <laughs> Same idea without the monsters in the way. But anyway, so. Um, my wife, by the way, will not play uh, miniature golf with me, so maybe one day one of you can call me and we'll go play, because I never get to play. I want to I play against Godzilla. That's the best part. But anyway, so, so best, uh, 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 they play best ball, and here's what best ball means. Best ball means that all four people hit off the tee, and then, you know, my ball, which is in the woods, uh, if you can find it, I pick up my ball, and I go to where the best player hit best game ever for terrible golfers. It's just wonderful. And so we hit off the first tee, we do things, and they had to take one hit, one drive from every golfer before nine holes. Let me tell you something. I can get one good shot out of nine drives. I promise you, uh, you'll be surprised. You'd be like, and, and that's the one where everybody goes, whoa, how did you do that? To which I answer, this is, this is lucky. I was like, so, so of course I did one that was awesome and they take that. We get to the end and we won the whole tournament. We won prizes, we won gift certificates, we got dinner, all this awesome stuff. But I'm neglecting to tell you one part. By the way, I was the worst golfer in that group, but I got a trophy because one of the guys on our team was a PGA player. When I found out he was on our team, I remember thinking like, whoa, how is this even fair? I felt bad for everybody else. Of course, I took the trophy and put it on my shelf for years and years. Like, there I am, best golfer of that tournament for a couple of minutes when I played off of the PGA player. But I don't know if you've ever played with somebody from the PGA or been near them when they hit the ball. It is a different sound than normal people make. It is like listening to a fastball in baseball when you go and sit right behind the, the home plate and you hear that ball hit the mitt and you think, how did that guy even catch it? That's it, but with a golf ball. You'd hear the guy hit, and we'd all, you had no idea where it went. And you'd get in your cart, and I'd pick up my ball, and then we'd just keep driving and driving and driving. And 
Oh yeah, up there on the, on the green, right next to the hole. Is that your ball? Yeah, that's my ball. Okay. And you all drop right there. And then all you need is one of your guys to make a putt. It was awesome. I was like, I don't even know. I think we hit like, I don't know, we got like 10. I don't know what we got, but it was the most amazing day of golf. And then we won. And then we got recognized. They stood us up like I had done something. Like I'm standing next to the PGA guy like, yeah, I'm as good as he is today. It's awesome, right? And you should have seen it. I'm like putting. You don't know how bad I am. I can't chip. So I would putt 100 yards out. And one time I putted 100 yards out and made it in the hole. The guy's like, that's a good technique there. And I'm like, that's not technique. That's called stupidity. And it was, it was just this awesome, perfect day. But can I tell you a secret? I had nothing to do with that trophy. So I finally got rid of it. I said, you know what? I've had this on my shelf. People ask me about it. I actually felt guilty for having it. Of course, I didn't mind taking a picture so that I could have it for illustration. It was about this tall. And here's the deal. I would love it if other people were responsible for you using your spiritual gifts. I, as your pastor, would love to tell you what to do. I got to admit that. Let's just, you know, I want you to say no to other people and yes to whatever I ask you, right? And you're the same way. You're the same way. So today, here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to look at this idea of everything that we have, whatever your gifts are. By the way, you're going to be really good at some things and really bad at others. We talked about that last week a little bit. Everything we have is God, but how God's, but how are we going to use it? We are trusted with gifts and time. We should plant properly and not give up. And we should use our gifts and time to bless others. So let's look at these. Number one, you are trusted with gifts and time. And if you have your Bibles, we can turn to Galatians chapter 6. Once again, that'll be our primary text. I brought in some supporting text, but that's our primary text today. Galatians 6, starting in verse 4. Each one should test, and this is the word in the Greek that means to test like... um, like fire tests gold. That would be a good way to think of it. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing them to someone else. Time out. So I didn't get to compare my golf to that guy's golf, thank God. I just got to enjoy the benefits of it. But here's the idea. Listen, you can't blame someone else for not using the gifts God gave you. You can't say, well, I got hurt by church, so I don't help people anymore. I helped somebody one time, and I don't help people anymore. When you get to heaven, God's not going to say, you mean your pastor? You didn't like your pastor? Oh, I'm so sorry. That's not how it works. God doesn't say, oh, your, your spouse nagged you, and so you quit helping. You quit coming to church. You quit helping people. You quit going out of your way. You quit doing what God called you to do. Oh, well, then you get a pass. I'll blame them. That's not how it works. Each one should test their own action. By the way, a little side note for those of us who have children. You're going to love this. Your kids will hate it. If you're in your mid-20s and you're still blaming your parents for your life, <clears throat> get a counselor. you got to get over it. You can't keep blaming your parents. My mom is 90, almost 90, still lives with us, and I could blame her for lots of stuff. But I can also blame her for a lot of good stuff in my life. And the truth is, if I was this old and still blaming my mama for what I'm doing, some of you would hopefully smack me across the side of the head and say, leave your mama alone. And that's what this is talking about. It says, don't compare yourselves to others. You're not responsible for their gifts. You're not, but I got hurt. But so-and-so did this. I don't like the church. I don't like Christians. I don't like me. I had somebody tell me one time that they don't even use Christian businesses because they were hurt by Christians. And I'm like, What? You're responsible for yourself. So you can't look at me. By the way, I don't know your heart motivation. So God does, though. And so then it continues. For each one should carry their own load. By the way, this is the balance between enabling somebody and helping somebody. You're trying to help them to be able to carry their own load. You're not trying to continue to carry their own load forever. That's called enabling, right? Right? And we've all done it. We all have somebody in our lives that we're like, mm hmm. All right, here we go. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the world should, word should share all good things with their instructor. And that's the whole idea of giving. So let me show you what God is like in our life, okay? So this is you. This is you. And God has given you gifts, right? 
And so what are you responsible for? You're responsible for taking the gifts God has given you. Thank you, Blue Gatorade. You're responsible for taking the gifts God has given you. And what are you responsible for doing? Pouring that gift into the lives of other people. Whether that's time or money. By the way, you most likely, if you're still working, you exchanged your time for money. I hope, I hope, depending on where you work, maybe not. But, but the truth is, right? So you exchange that and you, you, know, you, you, you invest in other people. So it's the idea of whatever gift you have. If you have a gift of cooking, teach somebody else to cook. Ernie's taught so many people how to play guitar. Why? Because he knows how to play. So he's sat people down, said, hey, young people, I'm going to teach you. He taught your daughter, right? Right? And so the truth is, what's he doing? He's pouring that. And guess what? This bottle's going to be around a lot longer than this one. But let me tell you something else that's cool. Because sometimes we feel like, well, Eric, I'm just burned out. I, I just do too much. I just do too much. By the way, you ever notice they, they say you want something done? Ask a busy person. Let me tell you why sometimes that's true. It's not always true for this reason. Sometimes it's because that person can't say no. Do you know what this is? It's a ball valve, right? And this goes on the end of a spigot, right? And you turn it on, and if your water supply is great, it's just going to keep going, right? This is God. So when you pour out on others, one of the things I have noticed is when you give your life away. Now, I'm not talking about enabling people. I'm not talking about pouring everything out. But what I'm talking about is when you sit with God and you say, God, you pour into my life, it never stops. So that your whole life you can pour into the lives of others. That's why when you get around Betty, she's still poor into your life. How old are you now, Betty? 89. 89. Same age as my mama. So, so here's the thing. So, so uh, yeah, you can clap for her. That's all right. Clap loud. She's 89. All right. So here we go. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, Betty. <laughs> By the way, never ask a woman's age who's under 70. She'll get mad at you. But after 70, they start going, yeah, tell everybody. And, and so, just, so, but here's the thing. So what does Betty do? Betty's sitting at home. She says, God, pour into my life. And then she says, God, what do you want me to do? I want you to sing. Well, do you know I'm 89, God? By the way, God doesn't like excuses. And God goes, I know that. And so what does she do? She pours into somebody else's life. She poured into your life this morning. Somebody poured into your life. And here's the thing. When you get to heaven, God's not going to say, did you have it rough? Did you have a tough life in America in the 2000s? Oh, what happened to you? Was somebody mean to you? They wrote you a mean email. Okay, that's me being sarcastic. I don't think God is going to do that. But the truth is, he's going to bless the person who poured into your life. And then he's going to say, Whose life did you pour your life into? The gifts, the talents, the things you know how to do. Is there anybody that you've poured your life into? And I would love to tell you that it's somebody else's fault because that would take the pressure off of you. But it is between you and Jesus. And let me just give you one more. It's not between you and me. You might get mad at me. You still are called to be faithful. I may do something dumb next week. Well, okay, another dumb thing next week. And you can't get to heaven and go, but you know, Pastor Eric was just an idiot. And God's going to go, I know. <laughs> but you're not responsible for that. And that's when you should go, okay, good. Listen to this, Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. Be very careful. And this word careful here is really cool. It's, it's where we get the word for periscope. Do you remember the old movies where they would say, periscope up, right? And the periscope would come up, and what the guy do? He'd fold the handles. I've never been in a submarine, but I could tell you that's the first thing. I don't know how the new ones, they probably don't work that way. But I remember the old ones, right? So the periscope goes up, they fold the thing down, and then he looks around, right? So this word means look at your life, pay attention, all, all areas, all things. By the way, we all have some weaknesses, right? We all have areas, blind spots. And so this says, hey, look all around. Be very careful how you live. And then it says, not as unwise. And this is where we get that idea of sophos. It's the idea of wise. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most when you feel good. Making the most when your emotions are in line. No. Making the most of every opportunity. You mean when I don't feel good? Yes. You mean when I'm grumpy? Yes. You mean when I'm tired? Yes. Making the most of every opportunity. Why? Because the days are evil. You think we could use that verse today? Well, sure. Sure. It's not a new verse. <laughs> it's been around for a long time. You think it's something new. 
Larry Burkett said this, the one principle that surrounds everything else is that of stewardship, that we are the managers of everything that God has given us. If you don't know about Larry Burkett, he worked out at the Space Center. He realized that Christians didn't know how to handle money. He went to a church called Park Avenue in Titusville, and he felt like God told him, quit your job and start a ministry to help people know how to handle money. And some guy named Dave Ramsey learned principles from him, and you probably know that name. And what did he do? This was his first principle. Everything I have is God. So I have to say, God, what do you want me to do with that? God, what do you want me? Listen, you're not accountable to your pastor for how you spend your time or your money. I would love that. I'll be glad to give you my opinion. But the truth is, you're not accountable to me. Who are you accountable to? You're accountable to God. Number two, plant properly, and that's just fun to say, and don't give up. I'm going to take a sip of water. I feel like a politician now. All right. So, sorry. Do you remember that video? That was the best video. I took this off my tree this morning. What kind of tree is that? Do you know, Gene? Maple tree. My favorite is maple. So, I went to the store a few years ago. I bought four maple trees, maybe five. And I planted them all over my yard. I was so excited. I watered them every day. I fertilize them. I make sure that they're getting what they need. And then every year, all of a sudden, those trees look dead. And so then I have a choice to make. Do I keep watering it? Am I just wasting water? And I think, well, I better keep watering it because I know something about maples. They lose their leaves, so when I'm supposed to, I try to water them. What I didn't know is during the winter, either rabbits or deer got hungry and they ate the bark off the bottom of three of my maple trees. Yes. But I didn't know they were dead. So I kept tending them, taking care of them, talking to them. I talk really nice to these maple trees. Hello, maple tree. You're going to look beautiful soon. Hang in there. And then spring came, and the one tree all of a sudden had green leaves, and the other one looked dead. And then I walked over to it, and crack, oh no. And then I noticed at the bottom something had eaten the bark off all the way around. Here's the truth about your life. There's going to be times in your life that you're going to pour your life into other people, and you're going to feel like a failure. When I've baptized 80-year-olds... All I can think of is their grandparents who prayed for them and died thinking, well, that was some wasted prayers. And these 80-year-olds will tell me, my grandmother had been praying for me so many years ago. And here's the fruit, what happened. In its season, in its season. And you're responsible, listen, you're responsible simply for spreading the seed, doing what God calls you to do. You're not responsible for the growth. You're not responsible for the win. You're just responsible to be faithful. How do I know that? Listen to this, Galatians 6, 7, and 8. It continues. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And by the way, I do think that God pulls weeds sometimes, which I'm very thankful for, right? Whoever sows to please the flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. So if you play video games all day long and all night long, guess what? Over time, it's going to affect you. If you watch TV, if, <clears throat> if you watch the news, I don't know why I'm so grumpy. I'll never forget one place I worked at. They had uh, uh, radio news on all day. This was when I was in my 20s. And I'll never forget, I thought the world was going to end. The world's going to end. The world's going to end. I would come home thinking the world's going to end. And then I bought a set of headphones, listened to music all day, and guess what? The world wasn't going to end. And by the way, this was during the Clintons, and we're still here, and I'm old, is what I just showed. The Clintons were a... Pr okay, I'm just making sure you knew who that was. Whoever sows to please is fresh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows from the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. So what are we talking about? Spending time in God's word. Spending time in praise and prayer. Taking time to be thankful and grateful. By the way, if you find that you watch the news and you're in a bad mood afterwards, take some time to be grateful. By the way, you were not created to try to control things around the world. 
Don't, do, do, I mean, the farmers had it better than we did. Because all they know is, looks like a cloud on the horizon. We're looking at stuff in China and wondering how it's going to affect us, which is crazy. How about take time to thank God for what's right here, right around you? You, you got clothes on? Did you eat? Did you drink some good coffee this morning? If you're still hungry, go get another. We'll be all right. We'll still be here for you. Isaiah 40, 31 says, wait on the Lord. And it says, you'll renew your strength. And so the truth is this whole idea of renewing your strength. And then it says, in doing good. Why? So don't grow weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. Can I encourage you? Don't give up. So, so, listen, at some point, almost everybody wants to stop their life. I've talked to people who've committed suicide. I come from a family where my father committed suicide. I know what it means to give up. And I remember thinking, if only you had waited. If only you had waited what you could see. If only you had waited, would you not see what's next, what God's going to do? Whether you're in emotional pain or physical pain or you're just tired of dealing with something, can I tell you, just be faithful. God has a way of using even what seems like failure for his success. <laughs> By the way, if you haven't fertilized with manure lately, you get that principle. <laughs> Only God can turn hog slop into bacon. Whew, man, he's good. I figure when we get to heaven, we're going to have apples that taste like bacon. That's kind of my, kind of my thing. Remember this. This is a long one, so hang with me. Uh, Colossians, uh, Corinth, first, uh, 2 Corinthians 9. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each of you should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. This word has decided. It's the idea of going to your storehouse and deciding what you take out. And then it continues. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. By the way, don't let a pastor, don't let a TV commercial with cute dogs, don't let whatever manipulate you into giving. Give what you decide in your heart prayerfully. God, this is what you want me to do. I'm going to be faithful to it. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they freely gathered their seed, their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase what? Your store of seed and enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. By the way, TV preachers will manipulate this passage and instead of saying stores of righteousness, they basically say, you give a dollar to me and God will give you two dollars back. It doesn't say that at all. It says, you give, and God gives you righteousness. Anybody ever go into the store and say, I want some bread? And they say, where's your money? You go, I just have righteousness. They don't take that in America. Okay? But the truth is, that's God currency. That's what you're responsible for. And remember, one day you're accountable. And guess what? God stores up righteousness, right? He's storing up those credits. That's what it talks about. And then it says, you'll be enriched in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. What does that mean? God's going to take care of you. And when you bless and do what he's called you to do, he's going to continue to bless you. Why? So you can bless other people. Some of us are poor because we've not been generous in what we have. I, I've never met a sad, generous person. Ever. Ever. Maybe I'm wrong, but, uh, but I mean, there's a reason there's an Ebenezer Scrooge movie, right? And through our generosity, excuse me, through us, your generosity result in thanksgiving to God. Now, let me tell you a couple things about our church. I have no idea what anyone gives. Very few people do, only the people that have to for the IRS. Otherwise, we wouldn't have anybody pay attention to it. But I don't know what anyone gives. And I told one of my friends, my friend said, you know, you really should know what people give. I said, no, no, no. I want to treat everyone equally bad. No matter how much they give, I want to treat them just as poorly. And I have a friend who vehemently disagrees with me. We've been friends for 20 years. And he says all the time, I want to know exactly what each of my leaders give. And I'm like, I, I don't want to know. Why? Because it's between you and God, not you and me. 
So please don't do what this one lady did. <laughs> one time years ago, a lady came up to me after a sermon where I saw, talked about money, and she said, you just gave that sermon because you know I don't give anything to this church. I said, well, I didn't know that till just now. She turned white as a sheet. It was the funny. I wish I could have had a, a, a video so you could see that. Look, three weeks later, she came up to me and goes, Pastor, I just want you to know that I'm giving every week now. <laughs> Great. <laughs> you know, I have no idea. So, so here's the truth. It's between you and God. It's not between you and me. I, I don't know anything about you anyway. I, listen, there's pastors who want a W-2 from members so they can tell them what they should give. That's crazy. If you go to a church like that, let me give you one word of what to do. Leave and don't ever come back. That has nothing to do with Jesus. That has to do with control and manipulation and stay away from it. And be careful of any pastor who uses this verse to say, you do this and God's going to make you rich because it's not about riches on earth. We're storing up for heaven and the currency is different. Heaven currency doesn't get you a loaf of bread. But Jesus will make sure you have everything you need. So be faithful to him. It's between you and him. Be in a, okay, anyway. Billy Graham said this, We have found in our own home that God, God's blessing upon the nine-tenths when we tithe helps it to go farther than the ten-tenths without his blessing. Dave Ramsey loves to say, if you can't live on nine-tenths, you can't live on ten-tenths. If you're a bad steward of nine, you're going to be a bad steward of ten. Every once in a while, somebody come up to me and say, Pastor, I want you to know if I win the lottery, I'm going to give 10%. And what I want to say, and I have never said, usually I just nod and smile, but what I want to say is, are you giving one-tenth now? I've never said it. It's one of those ADD things. Somehow all the other squirrels are like, no! Number three, use your gifts to bless others. By the way, I, I do appreciate when people say that. I know you don't mean it bad, and I'm not sitting here judging you for playing the lottery or whatever, but... Did I say all that? Is that enough? You got the idea. Because I know you mean well. Number three, use your gifts to bless others. Let's just suppose that my 90-year-old mother almost made cookies this morning and gave them to me and said, give these out at church. And I went around church and I was giving out cookies and people were like, oh, it's so really nice of your mom. And then I came to one person and they're like, I don't like cookies. Now let me tell you what I wouldn't do. I wouldn't take all those cookies and go to the trash can and throw them all away. And yet, that's exactly what people do with their gifts. You get hurt by somebody, somebody rejects God's gift, you, you, you do something and somebody's mean to you, you do something and you get rejected, you try to help somebody and they react against you and you say, no more, and you take your cookies and you throw them in the trash. God does not hold you accountable for their response. He holds you accountable for what he's given you. So what are your cookies that you need to share with others? What is it? Maybe you have a gift of literally cooking. Maybe it's sewing. Maybe it's a word of encouragement. Maybe it's being able to write somebody a nice note. We have a lady in our church that can't get out anymore that writes nice notes to people all the time. That's her ministry now. I just, I can't get out, but I can send notes. What's she doing? If God's going to give me a cookie, I'm going to give it to somebody. So what is it that God's given you financially, time-wise, gifts, talents? Galatians 6.10, Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to the people we like. I wish it said that. It doesn't. Let us do good to all people. And then he gives a caveat, especially those who belong to the family of believers. So don't plan on God doing something big with you until you've done the small things. I still remember I worked maintenance at Park Avenue for a while, and I would go in early in the morning. And I remember a couple mornings I went in to clean a bathroom, and all of a sudden the door flew open, and out came the pastor of the church who also had a worldwide ministry, and at that time was selling over $30,000 in books a year, back when $30,000 was a lot of money. And he came out with a toilet brush and a little thing. And he opened the door and scared the pajeebers out of me. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm cleaning the toilets in the morning. I like to clean the toilets here. I walked off. I'm like, you weirdo. What is that? But I totally get it now. He wanted to just be faithful. He knew how to clean a toilet. So guess what? He cleaned a toilet. 
Too many times we're looking for God to give us, uh, uh, we want to do the jobs that are up front, we want to do the jobs that people notice, but listen, if you're a greeter at our church, God's going to bless you. If you help with children, you get two crowns. If you help with sound, you get three because the pastor harasses you or, or back here with the with the media shout, and we're always needing people to do all of these different things. And so don't just look for what you notice. Also look for what you don't notice. And let me tell you one other thing. You're responsible for the gifts where there's a need near you. But Eric, I'm not very good at whatever. Yeah, but if nobody's doing it, guess what? If you're in the bathroom and there's trash on the floor, you don't say, well, I'm not gifted in trash pickup. I'll never forget, I was at one church, and they did spiritual gifts testing, and everybody quit working in the nursery. Because guess what? Nobody had written down, working with children. So none of them did. That church had to hire people to help in the nursery. And I remember thinking, you're, you're doing the opposite of what God's called you. Why? Jesus washed feet. Do you think he had it on his resume? Sorry, did I say that real sarcastically? I didn't mean to. Luke 6, give and it'll be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, it'll be poured to your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Let me give you a final story that I heard that I think is good. Because are we, since everything's God, are we being responsible? There were two young boys, and this will tell you how long ago it was. Their mom sent them in to the five and dime store and said, I want you to get a bag full of marbles. And so each boy got a little brown bag, little brown bag full of marbles. Older boy and the younger boy. And they left the store. They were so excited. They were looking through their marbles, all different colors and different swirls and different things. Some big ones, some small ones, a little bit of everything. And they would go to the park. And when they'd go to the park, the, all the little boys were playing marbles together. And if you don't know how marbles work, you hit marbles and you take marbles and you give marbles and you end up with more marbles and you end up with less marbles some week. And the younger brother every day would play marbles in the park. And the older brother would stand there just clutching the marble bag, clutching the marble bag, clutching the marble bag. And the little brother some days would come, be sad and he'd come home with less marbles. And then other days he was freaked out because he came home with a bunch of marbles he had won. And as they walk home every day, the older brother would say, well, I'm glad I didn't play. I got the same number I had before we went to the park. And one day when they got home from the park, the little brother had had a wonderful day again and talked about all the things he got to do with the marbles. And the older brother looked in his bag and got really sad because now there was a hole in his bag and there were no marbles left. And he had squandered all the time that he could have been playing, trying to hold on. Let me tell you something. There's a hole in our bags. All of us. And one day, there's going to be no more time to play marbles. No more time to bless somebody. No more time to encourage somebody. No more time to give somebody money. No more time to give somebody a plate of cookies. No more time to use our gifts and talents. And one day, that is going to run out. And God's going to say, what did you do with the marbles that I gave you? Like Steve talked about earlier. And you can't say, but my pastor. But my friend. But my spouse. But my children. You have to say, God, this is what I did with what you gave me. So I want to encourage you, be faithful with what God's given you. It's not between you and me. If you go here to church forever, if you go to another church, God's holding you accountable for you, not me. So I pray that you'll be faithful with what he's given you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'd love you to give your life to him today. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means that Jesus died and rose again to pay for our sins. And that when you surrender your life to him, that's what it means to be a disciple, to be a Christian, to surrender your, your will to his will. To give up your selfishness and say, Jesus, I choose your kingdom. I want to follow you the rest of my life. So if you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you more after the service about what that means. If you're here today and the truth is you know an area, God put a finger on your life and said, that one was for you. That's between you and him, not between you and me. So just be faithful to what he's called you to do. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time this morning. Thank you for your word, your strength, your love, your power. Lord, I pray for anyone who this is the first sermon they've ever heard. Lord, I pray they would just be faithful to you. To do what you've called them to do, not what some pastor called them to do, not what somebody told them was right. Lord, I pray that for all of us. I know you will give us the strength. You will pour into our lives so we can pour into the lives of others. May we be faithful with what you've given. In Jesus' name. Amen.